Welcome to this online service of Cumbernauld Free Church. My name's Andy and it's my joy to welcome everyone tuning in online with us this morning. Especially if this is your first time, we want to extend a very warm welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and trust you'll be blessed as you join with us. If you're free tonight, we have a Zoom meeting. Uh, you can email us to get the details and we're going to be hearing the testimony of one of our members, uh, Richard Stewart. And so we're looking forward to that. Do join us at seven o'clock for that. And the prayer meeting and Bible study as normal this coming Wednesday at 7.30. Well, as we gather to worship, we are going to read a call to worship from the Psalms and Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. The name of the Lord is to be praised. Well, that's what we're going to do this morning. And we're going to begin our time by praising God's name and singing, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Almighty God, we come into your presence this morning to sit at your feet, to gaze upon your beauty, to receive your loving instructions, to heed your gentle rebukes, to receive your wise correction, and to be trained by you in righteousness. We acknowledge that you are the source and spring of all of our blessings. We know that you will open wide the gates of heaven and pour out your mercy upon us. And so as we come before you, we pray that you would quicken our spirits, enliven our consciences, enlighten our minds, enlarge our hearts, and motivate our wills to obedience. Strengthen our hearts by your grace, so that we will hold on to you and never let you go. Almighty God, we thank you that you're scrupulous in justice, you're perfect in knowledge, all your judgments are right and just, in judgment, you only give people what their sins deserve and no more. You're never cruel or harsh. No one can rightly complain that you've been unfair towards them. And so we praise you, the judge of all the earth, who always does right. 
We praise you, Almighty God, because you're rich in love and full of compassion. Your grace even now extends to the worst of sinners who are willing to repent. Or we thank you that your love is unchanging. We thank you that nothing can separate us from your love. You are faithful forever, even though we are faithless time and time again. Or we thank you this morning that you are for us. And so who can be against us? You who did not spare your own son, but gave him up for us all. How will you not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Lord, who will bring charge against those whom you have chosen? It is you who justifies. Who is it that condemns? Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life and is at the right hand and is also interceding for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord, extol his goodness. For his love endures always Who can tell his mighty actions Or in full declare his praise Blessed are those whose way is right Acting justly in his sight when you show your people favor, then, O oh Lord, remember me. Help me when you come to save them. Let me know prosperity. Joyful with your chosen race, joining them in giving praise. We have sinned just like our fathers. We have done what was not right. When our fathers were in Egypt, they despised your deeds of might. All your mercies they ignored At the Red Sea spurned the Lord Yet for his name's sake he saved them And revealed his mighty hand By his word the sea he parted let them through us on dry land. From the hand of force set free, rescued from the enemy. Reading is from Exodus chapter 13, and we're picking things up at verse 17 and reading through chapter 14 and verse 14. So let's hear the word of God. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt, armed for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the sons of Israel swear an oath. He said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Succoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Pihiroth, between Migdol and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think, The Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, 
and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So so the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots, along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites, who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi-Hiroth, opposite Baal-Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Amen, and may God bless this reading from his holy word.
Well, I trust that that hymn will really serve as a prayer for us as we come to God's word. It would be great if you could have your Bibles open at Exodus chapter 13 and verse 17. Finally, at last, we come to the point in the story of Exodus where God's people are triumphantly marching out of the land of Egypt. And as we uh, study this passage together, my, my plan's very simple. I want us to walk through these verses and see the lessons that God wants to impress upon our hearts. This is the moment we've been waiting for. God's people leaving Egypt and heading to the promised land. Now in verse 17 of chapter 13, Moses sets the scene for us. Look at the opening words. When Pharaoh let the people go. So as we picture God's people in our mind's eye, I think we're to imagine them with a spring in their step. They are leaving the land that has caused them so much misery, pain, and suffering. They had been slaves for 430 years, but now they are free. Now they have their first taste, their first experience of the reality of living as free people. I suspect they were feeling like they were on top of the world. They must have been filled with joy and elation knowing that God had just delivered them and they had been mere spectators to his deliverance. And, and, and remember that as God's people were leaving Egypt, we were told that the Egyptians, God had made them favorably, favorably disposed to the Israelites, so they gave them gifts of silver and gold. And so as we picture them marching out of Egypt, um, picture them like a victorious army carrying and weighed down with all this loot. Now, I say picture them like a victorious army because we actually are told that in verse 18. See, if you look at the, verse, the end of verse 18, we read the Israelites went up out of Egypt armed for battle. Now, it would be easy to read this verse and think it meant they left Egypt tooled up for battle. But the, the idea the scholars point out to us is that they left Egypt in an orderly manner, like they were in a military formation. And so as we picture them marching out, they're marching out with confidence, they're marching out with hope, hope for this, their future, they're marching out breathing a new air. Life is different. They are God's triumphant and victorious people. Now, let's look at what verses 17 and 18 say regarding what happens as they left Egypt. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, that, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. So God's people are making their journey towards the promised land, but God doesn't lead them on the quickest route to Canaan. God takes them the long way round, by the desert. And here we have our first unexpected twist in the story. God led his people the long way. Now, the long way doesn't necessarily mean it was the wrong way or the worst way. Indeed, we're going to see in this passage, it was actually the best way. Because God's leading always takes us to the place will be best for us as his people. Now, it'd be very easy to, to, to miss what verses 17 and 18 say. In verses 17 and 18, we're told that God was sovereignly supervising and controlling the affairs of his people. So in verse 17, we're told God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. And then in verse 18, we're told God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. Don't miss it. The Lord did not leave his people to their own devices. No, God led them. As we began the service singing, guide me, O thou great Jehovah, God guided his people out of Egypt. And he led them in the way that he wanted them to go. Now, why didn't God take them through the Philistine country? Well, we're told in verse 17, For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. Understand this about God. He always 
knows what's best for his people. God knew that his people weren't ready for a battle. They weren't ready for confrontation. His people were fragile, weak, and vulnerable. They, had, they were newly liberated slaves. And of course, they didn't have the stomach for war. They weren't ready to face a determined opposition like the Philistines, seasoned in battle. In fact, notice what God says. If they face war, the Israelites might change their minds and return to Egypt. In other words, God knew that there was the very real possibility that his people would be so discouraged by a battle that they would want to return to Egypt. And so God led them, not on a shorter route, but on a longer route, because he knew what was best for them. Let me say what I've said before. God always knows what's best for his people. Now, now we see in this, um, in, in this action of God leading them this way that God was being gracious and compassionate. But, but not only that, we need to recognize and realize that God always has more purposes than we can ever imagine. One person said, in every situation and in every circumstance of life, God is always doing a thousand different things that we cannot see and we do not know. And we're going to see that in this passage. God was doing more than just one thing. He was doing a number of things that his people could not see and did not yet know. Because one of the Lord's purposes in taking his people this way was he had some unfinished business with the Egyptians. And he was about to settle it. And he was going to use this journey by the Red Sea to do that. You and I need to know that as God is sovereignly supervising and overseeing all of our steps in life, no matter how the difficult the journey may feel right now as we live in this pan global pandemic, we need to know that God is working out his perfect plan. And he has a thousand purposes that we don't know about. But we can be assured, as we're going to see in this passage, it is always, his purposes are always to showcase his glory. And they're always for our good. God always does what is best for us. Can I press pause for a moment and ask us just a, a heart-searching, soul-searching question? How would it change our experience of this global pandemic that we're living in right now if we were to believe that God had led us into it for a great purpose? Sometimes we, we look at the twists and the turns in, in, in the road of the journey of faith as, as real inconveniences. Not as blessings, but as curses. What if this fork in the road that we find ourselves at right now in the journey of faith, God has a glorious purpose that we cannot fully see and we don't yet fully understand. There is no predicament in the universe that God will not use to fulfill his good plans and purposes. No matter how difficult and hard they may be. So let's continue with the story. God led his people by the way of the desert near the Red Sea. And then in verse 19, God gave, we're told God gave his people a reminder that he would in due course bring them to Canaan. God's not just a gracious and compassionate God who's working out his perfect plans and promises. He also gives his people a reassurance. Now, we're not sure if their eyes were open to it, but just look down at verse 19. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the sons of Israel swear an oath. He said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. At the beginning, I mentioned how God's people left Egypt and they were weighed down with the gold and silver given to them by the Egyptians. Well, in verse 19, we read that they were weighed down with something else, or I rather should say someone else, Joseph, because Moses took Joseph's bones with him. 
Joseph, remember, he was the reason how they, God's people ended up in Egypt in the first place. Joseph, just before he died, he made an oath. He made the Israelites swear an oath regarding what would be done with his body when he died. He said, God will surely come to your aid. And when he does, you are to take me with you to the promised land. And what have we just seen God do? He's come to their aid. He's delivered them from Egypt. He's been faithful to his promise. He's been faithful to his word. And now he's leading them to the promised land. And they're carrying Joseph's coffin, or perhaps because he was a prince of Egypt, his sarcophagus. And as they're carrying it, God's people should have been aware that God was being faithful to the promise that he made a way back to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob, that he would deliver his people from slavery and bring them to the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. God's people should have recognized in Joseph's coffin that their God was a faithful God. I wonder, church, do you and I realize how faithful God is? How, how, how faithful God is to his promises. You know, it, it's quite striking, isn't it, that in this moment, this season of life, uh, that one of the emblems, say, of the NHS has become the rainbow flag. Every time we see a rainbow, we know from God's word, it is a promise that God will never flood the world like he did in the days of Noah. Every time we see a rainbow, we are to be reminded of God's promise to us as his people. Every time we wake up, God is faithful to his promise to give us new mercies because great is his faithfulness as we read in Lamentations. As God's people, we are to look around us and see evidence that God is faithful to all that he says and we can take him at his word. Now let's pick things up in verse 20. After leaving Succoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. Now, maybe it was at this point that God's people began to realize that, that they were headed in a strange direction. Like they, they knew that they were headed to the promised land. That was always the plan and the purpose. But you can imagine them saying to themselves, where are we going? Like, why are we being led to the desert? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't feel right. We, we, we're walking away from everything we're supposed to be walking towards. But in the verses that follow, we see that their movement was not panicked flight, but it was God's deliberate purpose. Look at verse 21. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or by night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Here we see the incredible provision of God to, to guide his people. They have a cloud in the day, a fire by night. And just in case you don't know, fire in the Bible always represents God's presence. Remember the burning bush when uh, God appeared to Moses in the burning bush? Now, it must have been really assuring for them to know that God was guiding them 24 7 How encouraging, how caring, how reassuring that God was always with them. He was leading them on their way. All they had to do was look up and see the cloud and see the pillar of fire. This massive, visible demonstration of God's presence. God was their companion, leading them in the way that he wanted them to go. And there's a lesson there for you and I, isn't there? God always leads his people. And today we know that we have living within our hearts the, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that he would be with us until the end of the age and when he gave the Great Commission just before his ascension. We've not been left as orphans in this world, but we've been given the very presence of God in us as we live 
this life of faith. As we journey through this world, God is the one who's leading and guiding us. Now, pick things up in chapter 14, verses 1 to 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Pihiroth, between Migdol and the sea. They're to encamp by the sea directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think, The Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army. And the, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the, so the Israelites did this. Now here's another twist in the story. God tells his people, like, turn back, turn back and encamp here. And this place where they were to encamp, it wasn't a particularly good one. Because it meant that they would have their backs to the sea and in front of them was the desert. And, and Pharaoh's military scouts, who would be no doubt patrolling the borders, would look out and see that, that it looks like the people of Israel are in a state of confusion. And no doubt as this military intelligence was brought to Pharaoh, he would think, these former slaves of mine are unable to cope with their newfound freedom. And, and so it would be easy for him to think that he could recapture them as they were straying. Not only that, we know that that was God's very plan and God was going to harden Pharaoh's heart so that he would pursue them. Now in verse 4b, we are told why the Lord did this. Every time God had hardened Pharaoh's heart in the, the story of the plagues, he always had a purpose. And the purpose has never changed. Look at verse 4b. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. That's the message of the book of Exodus, that all the world would know the Lord, and that the Lord would gain glory for himself. The reason God led his people to this point to this impossible place, to this dead-end valley where there seemed that there was no way through was because God was going to gain glory for himself and show the Egyptians that he was Lord. And what do we read? We read that the Israelites trusted in God. They obeyed what God said. They encamped right there. And you know, in the journey of faith, that is exactly what we all need to do as God's people. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. We need to do what God asks us to do. Now, I know this is self-evident, but, but just think about the people of Israel for a moment. They had just discovered this newfound freedom, and perhaps you're a young Christian, and, 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 and you're living your Christian life, and you've heard it said again and again, you've been saved from the punishment of your sin. You're now free in Christ. Listen, we use our freedom to obey God's word and God's will. We use our freedom to trust God's word and obey his will. We don't do what we're inclined to, uh, to do from our flesh. We do that which God wants us to do. Now, now notice... It's not just Pharaoh who gave the lead on pursuing the Egyptians. Verse 5 onwards, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We have left, let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready, took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots, all along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi-Hiroth, opposite baal -Zephon. Now, it's, it's evident that Pharaoh and his officials have clearly forgotten what God had 
just done in Egypt with all the plagues. And Pharaoh and his officials, they, they, they take the bait. They, they, they look at the Israelites and they think that they're in confusion and they're wandering to and fro and have encamped in this awful place. And so now they choose to go after them. Now, you can imagine that as they went after them, they were filled with passion. They were, their emotions would have been running high. Remember, it was the God of Israel who was responsible for killing their firstborn sons. They would have been angry. They would have been hardened. And not only that, they realized these were their slaves. And without them, their economy would come to ruins. And so Pharaoh's response is formidable. He, 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 we're told again and again, he takes his chariots. Now, at that point in history, chariots were the most advanced technological military warfare. And so the picture here is of Egypt at its, at its most powerful, coming after God's people who are a sitting duck. They've got their backs to the Red Sea. They've got the desert in front of them. And, and as we look at this situation, we might think it's, it's an impossible situation. God's people are going to be destroyed. But we know that God has them here because he's going to use it to gain glory for himself and teach these Egyptians once and for all that he is Lord and God. Now look at verses 10 and 12. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. Try and imagine what it must have been like for the Israelites as they saw the Egyptians coming towards them. You can imagine the, the, the fear overcoming them. They probably hadn't posted any scouts uh, out, so, so probably all of a sudden they just turn around and they see this massive plume of dust as these chariots and horses and men come marching towards them. And we're told of the fear that seized them. They look up and their former oppressors are coming towards them. And one look at their enemies, literally for the Israelites, means they lose all faith in the Lord. <laughs> they, 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 they were terrified. They cried out. They, they said to Moses, Was it because there was no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So here's the first major trial God's people have faced since leaving Egypt. And they lose, they lose perspective in this whole journey that God has them on. Even though they're carrying Joseph's bones, which is a reminder of God's faithfulness to his promises. Here God's people start to doubt. Now what they say is rather sarcastic. E Egypt was a place that in many ways was, was, was filled with graves. That's what the pyramids were. It, it, it was famous for, the, Egypt, the Egyptians were famous for their, for their commitment to, to the death and the afterlife. And they're like, why have you brought us out here to die? It would be better to die in there. And, and then they reveal the, their heart's inclination is they, they, they would rather be in Egypt than out here in the desert. And, and they start saying, Moses, we told you just to leave us alone. But you wouldn't listen to us. Now, all throughout the story, all throughout the narrative of, Egypt, eh, of, of Exodus so far, Moses hasn't been the most convincing of leaders. But in this moment, Moses shows his true qualities as a leader of God's people. Look at verses 13 and 14, and we'll, we'll finish with these verses. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance of the Lord the Lord will bring you today. The, the, the Egyptians you see today, you'll never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Now, just so we, we, we hear this right, Moses' tone is not one of comfort 
but it is one of correction. He lifts up his voice and he exhorts his people. Listen, guys, do not be afraid. Now, you've heard this a million times, but this is the most repeated command in the scriptures. I think there's 365 mentions of this command in the Bible, one for every day. Do not be afraid. God knew the propensity and the tendency of his people was to fear. And here Moses stands up as God's spokesman and says to the people, do not be afraid. Why not? Because today they were going to see the deliverance that the Lord was about to bring. God was about to destroy the Egyptians. He was going to fight for his people. And all his people had to do was stand firm. That's not run away and be still. And this is the first point in in the story of Exodus that we have this image of God as the divine warrior fighting on behalf of his people. And this is an image we're going to see repeated again and again. God will always fight on behalf of his people. You see, one of the most amazing things about salvation, deliverance from God, is it's a spectator sport. We, God's people, do nothing. God does everything. All we need to do, and it, and it, and it sounds easy, but it's actually really hard, is stand firm. All we need to do is be still. In other words, we need to rest all of our confidence in God and not be overwhelmed by our circumstances, by our enemies, because God is the one who is in control and God is the one who will always have the victory in the end. Now, 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 just as I draw this sermon to an end, can I, can I draw out three major lessons that this passage as a whole teaches us? Number one is this. God often takes us down routes that don't seem obvious at first. Often the routes that God takes us down in life and the journey of faith aren't our preferred route. But brothers and sisters, we need to be grateful for the infinite wisdom of God. Because it always transcends our small perspective in life. And God always knows what he's doing. And it will always be for our best and his glory. Then, church, we need to remember God will always be faithful. Even when we're faithless. God will always be faithful to his word so we can take him at his word. God promises in the the Bible again and again. He will never leave us nor forsake us. God promises that he will finish what he's begun in us. And he does all things well. God's always faithful to lead us as his people. Here in this story, he led them by the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. But we know God today leads us by his spirit. In the way that we should go. And he will be with us until the very end. Because God is faithful. And so no matter what situation, circumstances we find ourselves in, we must remember God is with us. And then finally, church, we must not fear. We must stand firm and be still. We must stand firm and be still. Because this is the posture God wants of us, his people. One where we show that we're living absolutely dependent and confident in him. Even when our backs, if you like, are against the wall and all that's in front of us looks terrifying, God wants us to stand firm. How is it possible for us to stand firm and not fear? Well, we need to know what God's pe- God told his people through Moses that day. He will fight for us. And there we see God's gracious character. God will always work on behalf of us, his people. Because God is for us. And the reason he does it at the heart of all of the purposes of God is his glory and our good. There's nowhere else that we see that more clearly displayed 
than at the cross of Jesus Christ, where God, in Christ, defeats and disarms our enemy, Satan. He destroys death, literally nails our sinful record to the cross so that we are forgiven. You know, there's no dead end situation for God's people. God will always deliver his people. And God's ultimate plan for all of us as his people is to bring us to the promised land, to bring us to the new heavens and the new earth. Let me finish this sermon by quoting from Romans 8. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life and is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, persecution or famine, nakedness, danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquered through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Lord, in light of this passage, we want to rest all of our confidence in you and all of our trust in you because you always do what's best for us. You're so faithful to your word. You're faithful to, to save. Your arm is not short to save. You're mighty to save. And God, even as we find ourselves living in a strange time of lockdown and global pandemic, we pray that you'd help us not to be afraid, but to stand firm and to be still so that we can watch on as you perform wonders for your own glory and as you work out your own purposes in, through, our lives. Lord, we are humble to know that even though we don't see it and often don't know it, you're doing 10,000 things in one moment and we may only see one of them. How awesome and great you are. No predicament, no global pandemic is too big for you. But it's just another opportunity for you to showcase your glory. Lord, we, we look forward to the day where we will come to the promised land and there will be no more sin, there will be no suffering, there will be no more enemies and there will be no more death, but there will be life and life in its abundance in your presence. And we look forward to that day when we will be guided into your near presence to live with you forevermore. So Lord, hear this our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our benediction comes from Romans this morning. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give us a spirit of unity among ourselves as we follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth we may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in him, so that we may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Go love your God.